Today is our honor to be speaking with Professor Jonathan Tan. Professor Tan is Archbishop Paul J. Hallinan, Professor of Catholic Studies at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. He is the author of several texts on world Christianity, including Introducing Asian American Theologies, Christian Mission Among the Peoples of Asia, and also he and An Q. Tran are the co-editors of the text that we'll be discussing today, World Christianity, Perspectives and Insights. Professor Tan, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jonathan, for inviting me to this conversation. Professor Tan, as we begin, World Christianity, Perspectives and Insights is an anthology of essays uh, dedicated to the honor of Peter C. Fan. When did you first learn of Peter Fan's research? Oh, Peter Fan was actually my uh, doctor father. He was my uh, uh, PhD advisor and my dissertation director. So the book, you know, both my co-editor and me, we are both his students, uh, doctoral students. And it was a work that several of us who were either his students or his collaborators or his uh, close friends uh, who decided to honor him uh, on the occasion of his 70th birthday, as you see in the dedication. Hmm. And it is an important milestone uh, for us because there are so few Asian American theologians who have reached the kind of uh, level that who is uh, cited and quoted and seen as uh, the movers and shakers in the theological world. So I think it is just as important to honor him with a fast shift. What is some of the early research of Peter Fan that most attracted you to his work? I think. Uh, what attracted me to Peter Fan and to study with, with him at, when he was te at the time he was at the Catholic University of America was his work on Asian Christianity. Uh, there were very few uh, professors in the U.S. who were doing Asian and Asian American Christianity generally and Asian and Asian American Catholicism in particular. So his work in that field. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, which is marked by his book Mission and Catechesis where he look at the work of the enculturation of Christianity in Vietnam so, mm. so that attracted me to work with him and to uh, have him direct my research Dr. Tan, would you be willing to share just a moment of your personal story? How did you come to teach theology in the United States? And when did you first develop academic interests in world Christianity? I think I was always interested in uh, Christianity, missions, world Christianity at a young age. And it was always uh, my dream to pursue graduate studies in theology. So when I could, uh, I started my graduate studies in theology at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. So that got, and it was in the early, in the mid 1990s. And at that time, uh, when I finished my masters, I was looking for, looking to continue. And there were very few universities in the 1990s, the doctoral programs that were interested in contextual theology because I was interested in contextual theology uh, the relationship between faith and culture and mission uh, so when I was looking for doctoral advisors and who I could work with so Peter's name came on board so and so I uh, applied uh, to Catholic University of America was ex accepted and so I studied with Peter from 1998 to 2002 when I graduated. So I've been teaching theology. I've been a professor since 2002. Mm. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Dr. Tan, part two of the text, World Christianity, Perspectives and Insights, is titled World Christianity and New Ways of Doing Theology. This part in the text features contributions on an array of dogmatic foci, including the sacraments, the trinity, Christology, hermeneutics, missions, and more. What is it precisely about the phenomenon of world Christianity that opens up new insights into these traditional areas of theological research? I think the shift 
from mission studies to world Christianity is an important paradigm shift and should not be overlooked because for the longest time we have often conceived the world I mean, and we look at evangelism from the perspective of sending churches and receiving churches and the idea that mission lands are passive recipients because the real theological work is done in Europe or North America you know, that's where theology is done and when we go to the global south it is pastoral ministry evangelism church planting it, it, it's a sort of like recipients what this goes to show is that you no, know, these are not just simply uh, mission plans or church plans, but they are also churches in their own right. And you know, when we look at uh, Christianity through a contextual lens, we realize that all Christianity is ultimately contextual, even European Christianity. If that's the case, systematic theology doctrines theological reflections also take place in the global south, in, in the tutor's world. And so this book is a collection of essays and perspectives of how might systematic theology look if the theologians who are doing the theological reflections take their cues, their social location from all across the world, North America, South America, in Asia and what might that say because what we are looking for now is not just a one way street but a two way dialogue between theologians in the global north engaging in a dialogue with theologians in the global south hmm. I'm struck by your phrase uh, world Christianity opens the insight that these uh, churches in the so called two thirds world are quote churches in their own right uh, not mission fields, but actual churches and ought to be producing theology. Uh, can you help me unpack that phrase? What do you mean when you say the churches in the two-thirds world are churches in their own right? What does that mean theologically? What I mean is we have to go beyond the denominationalism that came about you know, as the fruits of the Protestant Reformation. We are going to celebrate 500 years of the Protestant Reformation next year. But part of the churches or the way of looking at church that was that the mission the missionaries planted in the tutors world was they replicate replicated their denominational structures, their theological confessions and stuff in the tutors world. So when we talk about African initiated churches, Asian initiated churches, local churches, emergent churches, these are real churches that emerged from the ground up in response to uh, context, challenges, life experiences that are encountered. The theological battles of Europe, confessional battles between reform, mainline Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, are not really the issues that confront Christians in Africa, Asia, and Latin America today. Hmm. And which explains the explosion of the so-called, uh, you know, what we call African or Asian initiated churches, sometimes called independent churches, but they're not really independent. I mean, God, no church is truly independent. All churches find their the, the foundation of their faith in Jesus Christ. I hear you say, Doctor. I hear you saying, Doctor Tan, that uh, global theology, world Christian theology, is a theology that's done with the conviction that all Christianity is ultimately contextual and that this theology is being done from a world Christian perspective, therefore. Is it possible that we've been doing theology in a particularly Western way, and that in fact the project of world Christian theology ought to expand beyond our categories of traditional theology? Oh, that is possible. I mean, questions and challenges arise. Much of the theology that have emerged in Europe, looking from classical theology of, say, Augustine or Aquinas in response, and then we move to, say, Martin Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Karl Barth, they were all responding to the social challenges, political challenges, cultural challenges of their times, whether it's anti-clericalism, uh, church and politics, church and state. So likewise, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, 
faith and the development of faith and doctrine and theological reflections take on very different color because we have to look at the challenges that Christians in Asia and Africa are facing and see how they, they respond to that. Dr. Tan, what is one area of theological research that you would uh, welcome new contributions on from a world Christian perspective? I think it's the field of ecclesiology, the theology of church. Uh, this is a, I think the time is ripe to move beyond the denominational structures that is the legacy of the Reformation and to rethink what it means to be a follower of Christ. Because I'm sure you're aware, I mean, uh, Bill Diner's latest book on uh, emergent insider movements uh, and Simon Chan in his uh, Grassroots Asian Theology, the last chapter of his book, where he, both uh, Diner's Chan and you know even myself too, we are interested to look at emergent movements where there's this rise of this phenomenon in Africa and in Asia about, uh, of folks who believe in Christ but not institutionally Christian. So like Chrislam in Nigeria, the Jesus uh, satsangs or Krish Bhakta in India, you have in Japan, in Thailand, in all across Asia and Africa, this phenomenon where they are followers of Jesus. They accept Jesus, they accept the gospel but they remain institutionally or and culturally perhaps you know african buddhist hindu so how do we make of that because if we count them as followers of jesus then jesus has a lot more followers i think the challenge that asians and africa is facing is as tremendous and as groundbreaking and in fact paradigm shifting the way when paul make that major shift for the gospel message from a purely Jewish phenomenon into, a, in his day and time, a global movement all across the Mediterranean whereby the gospel of Jesus is not limited to a certain cultural or social or traditional approach, but it transcends that and it can be uh, planted, it can emerge it can take on different forms in different contexts. So we are seeing, I I would argue, the kind of change that we saw with the first Pentecost and with Paul. We need new language. We need new ways. We need new theological concepts of saying, how do we include all these people who have chosen, who have been inspired by Jesus and his gospel, but who feel no desire and no need to want to join a traditional hmm. Eurocentric denominational structure. Hmm. Dr. Tan, you are a Roman Catholic theologian, and so you are a member of the Christian church that probably has the greatest in, uh, uh, emphasis on institutional unity and institutional presence. How do you reconcile these things in your own mind? And how, how do you understand theologically the diversity of streams of Christianity that we see around the world with the Roman Catholic claim that the church is absolutely one, also institutionally? Well, I mean, the, theologically, I mean, I would argue that the Catholic Church has shifted since Vatican II. I mean, in the old days, this the notion of extra ecclesiam nulla salus, outside the church there's no salvation, and the idea that the Catholic Church is absolutely the one true Church, the Holy Mother Church. But the but at Vatican II, the dogmatic constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, Article Number Eight, which speaks of the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. The phrase in Latin subsisted as, and that that article goes on to say that there are also uh, elements of truth, there are elements of Church beyond the Catholic Church. Now, conservatives in the Catholic Church, the traditionalists and others are very unhappy with that because it seems to suggest that the Church of Christ is broader, of which the Catholic Church is one important manifestation of it. 
but the Catholic Church does not fully capture or encapsulate that. So that gives an opening to my mind that that uh, of the kind of openness that, for example, you find with the current Pope Francis, who prefers to use the term Bishop of Rome rather than Pope, and who has uh, gone out of his way beyond what other popes has done to interact with the Orthodox, with the Lutherans. In fact, on October 31st this year, he will be in Sweden, in Lund, uh, to launch the 500th anniversary of the celebration of the Reformation. I mean, no pope would ever do that. because, but, but as you can see, so that kind of openness, I think, gives me hope. And another point that I want to add to, uh, the other thing that has really transformed the Catholic Church and Catholicism is the charismatic movement. In Latin America, close to 20% or some say even more Latin American Catholics are Pentecost- I mean, are charismatic. Mm. And same thing in Asia. The majority of Asian Catholics are charismatic. Now, the charismatic movement transcends institutional boundaries. And that itself creates, I think, new openings, new avenues for the kind of relationships and reconceptualizing church in a manner that perhaps, you know, if you just look at church through a Western gaze or Western filter, we might not see that. So I would argue that the charismatic movement coupled with the more traditional uh, Marian movements, the Marian devotion. So for example, in India, in Asia, most of the devotees who go to the popular devotions to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the pilgrimage sites, most of them are non-Christians, but they participate in Catholic rituals. So what we what we see is is a kind of complexity, uh, and one of the one of the difficulties of trying to define the boundaries of Catholicism, because with the charismatic movement, with popular devotions to saints and Mary that are you know, where the, most of the adherents are not Catholics or not even Christian to begin with. Mm. And coupled with these major changes that's happening after Vatican II that, that, uh, that suggest that we can look for the Church of Christ beyond the institutional boundaries of the Catholic Church, uh, although the Catholic Church is an is a, is a important, uh, definitive, but not exclusive uh, manifestation, I think it opens the floodgates to the kind of theological explorations that might lead to new insights for us today. Dr. Tan, chapter 17 of your text is an essay by Edmund Ki Fuk Chia, and it is entitled Interchurch Dialogue, Global Perspectives. In your view, sir, what are the real opportunities and the real challenges that the phenomenon of world Christianity brings to the ecumenical task? I think the, this phenomenon, I mean, the, 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 when we look at church through a global or world perspective, we see new ways of interactions. Like, for example, uh, I mentioned the charismatic movement. You know, I grew up in a more charismatic Catholic parish. Uh, you know, the youth groups that I, I attended were essentially ecumenical. The Bible studies that we did were basically ecumenical. So even though it was, uh, I mean, traditionally, at least institutionally, a Catholic parish, much of the music we used were charismatic praise and worship music, like, like Maranatha, Vineyard. Mm-hmm. We never used traditional Catholic hymns, you know. And most Catholic parishes around Asia are charismatic, are charismatic in orientation and so they, uh, we go to each other's prayer meetings, charismatic conventions so on and so forth so in that sense, world Christianity I think gives us a better lens rather than a, theolo- a traditional the- theology or ecclesiology that looks at this purely from say a western Protestant Reformation filter where everything is seen as us versus them. 
and the challenges I think in in Asia where there are so you know where Christianity is a minority religion um, if we exclude the Philippines and maybe East Timor Christianity is essentially a minority religion so which means you know the kind of ecumenical collaboration is really important so if you look at the chapter that you just cited by uh, Edmund Chair I think he also discussed uh, in one of the subsections, the, the the phenomenon of Pentecostal and Charismatics, as so I think he also mentioned the challenges of trying to relate to them because they are institutionally diverse. They are not as, you know, uh, in a sense, I mean, you think of a word, uh, they are not as structured in a way, but I think perhaps their flexibility and their dynamism is what is their strength. And so there is a lot of truth in the fact that when you say if, if Pentecostalism slash renewal Christianity were a denomination, they would be the largest denomination in the world. It's just that we don't look at it through that lens. And, and I think world Christianity allows us to see this global, transnational, uh, interlocking networks beyond traditional denominational structures. And looking at ecumenism, not just in terms of denominations coming together and working together, but new ways of being Christian. Dr. Tan, it's fascinating to hear you speak about the diversity and the unity of Christianity. We've been speaking about the diversity of Christianity, how it may look in its very different forms. Let's also address the unity of Christianity. Uh, what is it that makes the church the church? in an essential form. How is it that these different forms of Christianity, Asian Christianity, uh, Middle Eastern Christianity, all can represent the same body? Ultimately, the center of the church has to be and must be Jesus. Uh, beyond whatever institutional affiliation or confession or loyalty, what unites churches across the globe and, and, and when we look at world Christianity, global Christianity, it's a reality, it's a fact that all churches are ultimately communities of believers with Jesus Christ as the center. And the point that uh, St. Paul makes in his letters, in his, in his epistles, uh, to all the various local churches from Corinth, to Galatia, to Rome. So I think if we move beyond denominational structure and theolog theological debates and go back to the essentials, that what really matters is uh, putting Jesus at the front, at the center, at the beginning, and at the end. That uh, the, the gospel of Jesus, the good news that we share with our neighbors, the hospitality that we extend to everyone in the name of Jesus. I think that's what matters more than what theological confessions or debates. So if we use that as a starting point, I think we can go beyond the theological impasse of the Reformation and its legacy. And I would hazard a guess, I, I would suggest, in fact, that Africans and Asians and Latin American Christians who do not have the baggage of the Reformation and the centuries of debates and quarrels may be able to provide a way forward, uh, new ways of conceptualizing church, new ways of relating to Jesus and his gospel and bringing that to the world today. Dr. Tan, if I can ask you, what is it that Christians, individual Christians can do today to pursue the real unity of the church? I would suggest that Christians could learn to work together, learn to collaborate, because ultimately, as I explained, you know, what really matters is what we do to the world, not what we do within our institutions. So if you could go out and collaborate and work together, and that's what you see in, in Africa and Asia, especially in, in Asia where there is so uh, much uh, challenges that Christians face that you know you, you find a kind of ecumenical collaborations in many Asian countries 
simply because there is usually a common uh, enemy that they have to confront, whether it is nationalism or xenophobia or you know the kind of relig- uh, religious populism. So you you find the kind of working together, collaborating together, standing united together, and I think that every individual Christians uh, can do because it is not our institutional affiliation that ultimately saves us. It is our response to the gospel mandate and not just simply Matthew 28, the Great Commission, but also Matthew 25, you know, what have you done? You know, also the challenge of the parable of the Good Samaritan, who is my neighbor? What who do, what do we do to? And, and all those we can do without necessarily relating to the institution. We do it qua Christians, as Christians. Dr. Tan, can I close by asking you, what are your current and future research projects? What might we see you writing in the near future? Well, I'm looking at various aspects of world Christianity. So, uh, and some of this you can see you know, in my second book that you, you uh, referred to in the beginning of the interview, Christian Mission Among the Peoples of Asia. The last chapter of the book, you know, I look at two phenomenon, uh, that of migration, and the other one is cyberspace. I would like to explore that further in my further in my future research, because we have always looked at theology as propositions, as rational, critical discourse, but especially in Asia, Asia is where migration is has changed the face of Christianity. And I would like to explore what that means in the challenges for migration, because seven out of the ten countries that the World Bank has referred to as countries with the most migrant sending uh, people are in Asia. For example, in in the so-called Middle East, West Asia, Saudi Arabia, there are at least 1.5 million Catholics primarily Filipinos and Asian Indians who are working in the oil and hospitality, oil industries. Uh, but, you know, you cannot openly plan a church or have a, have a church in, in Saudi Arabia. So what does that mean? And it's essentially, uh, and vice versa, when Muslims move into areas where there's a Christian population, where Christians move into places with significant Hindu presence or Muslim presence, what does it mean for both the Christian as well as the non-Christians? So, and this is not really a, a theological debate. So we cannot close the floodgates and say no migration, notwithstanding developments in Europe and, for example, in the United States, where the kind of xenophobia and migrants, migration is part and parcel of being Christian today. And of course, cyberspace too. Uh, with people going online, with, and, and especially in, the, in Asia where, you know, what nourishes Christians in the Middle East where they're not allowed to have institutional congregation of, of churches, is the web. And so virtual meetings and whatnot, how do we rethink what does it mean to gather in a country like, like say, Saudi Arabia where you cannot gather for Sunday service because it's against the law where you cannot come in as a minister or pastor. But you can use the internet and they are using the internet. So I, I think and this, I think it goes back to your first question about doing theology. We have always done theology in the so-called West, Europe and North America. We do not realize it, but we are uncritically privileging our context, our social location, our debates which is essentially, we are still fighting battles that date back from the Reformation, and we are still trying to figure out what to do, where we are looking at elements like secularism and, and uh, you know, folks who stop going to church, the, the no religions. Those are important questions, but in the broader scheme of things, when we look globally, we see a very thriving Christianity the moment we go beyond Europe and North America. But this is the Christianity that thrives in challenges, in migration, in places where they are not allowed to open churches. But yet, there they are. They are united by social media. They are united by their faith. 
they are united by a kind of a uh, spiritual entrepreneurialism uh where perhaps you know they are telling us something and we could draw new theological insights from this immense uh, changes that, is, that are taking place right under our nose if only we are prepared to look there and and see what they are doing and then reflect on what the spirit is doing or what the, what the spirit is trying to tell us today. Hmm. It's been our distinct honor to be speaking with Professor Jonathan Tan, Archbishop Paul J. Hallen and Professor of Catholic Studies at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, also the editor of the text that we've been discussing today, World, Christian, uh, World Christianity, Perspectives and Insights. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan, for being with us. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the invitation to engage in a conversation on this book.